My name is Reverend Doug Jenkins, and we are glad that you are here to worship as we celebrate the resurrection of Ian Gustav Boyer. We are here gathered because we want to uh, celebrate his life, to reflect on God's purpose and God's call in all that we do. And you'll excuse me, my... One thing that in the service, there will be a time in which you will be invited to make a reflection upon Ian's life in your life. Uh, if, if you'd like, you can come up to the microphone. That would be best because the service is being broadcast live on Facebook, and that way everyone would be able to hear you. So you're invited at any time to come up and spend half an hour or shorter telling your stories about Ian. But at this time, if you would, let us stand and join together in our call to worship. We are met in the presence of God, and we do not meet alone. With the angels in the highest heavens, we gather to worship the Lord. With the saints of every age, we gather to worship the Lord. With the church throughout the world, we gather to worship the Lord. By children and babes at the breast, God's holy name be praised. With pipes and bells and harp, God's holy name be praised. In kirk and cathedral, God's holy name be praised. We are met in the presence of God, and we do not meet alone. Let us pray. God, kindle within our hearts today a flame of love for our neighbors, for our foes, for our friends, for our people, for the brave, for the cowardly, for the thoughtless ones. Lord Jesus Christ, in all that we love, may we serve you from the lowliest thing that lives to the name that is highest of all. Amen. And now let us join together as we sing morning has broken. Please be seated. We are called to confess our sin and to receive God's gracious mercy. So let us confess together. 
Eternal God, in every age you have raised up men and women to live and die in faith. We confess that we are indifferent to your will. You call us to proclaim your name, but we are silent. You call us to do what is just, but we remain idle. You call us to live faithfully, but we are afraid. In your mercy, forgive us. Give us courage to follow in your way, that joined with those from ages past, who have served you with faith, hope, and love, we may inherit the kingdom you promised, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear now an excerpt from the confession called the Scots Confession that we use here in the Presbyterian Church, and this is from chapter 8, called, entitled, Election. And this has nothing to do with politics. It has everything to do with God's choosing us and, and why. That same eternal God and Father who by grace alone chose in his Son, Christ Jesus, before the foundation of the world was laid, appointed him to be our head, our brother, our pastor, our great bishop of our souls. But since the opposition between the justice of God and our sins was, much, was such that no flesh by itself could, not, could nor might have attained unto God, it behooved the Son of God to descend to us and take himself a body of our body, flesh of our flesh, and bone of our bone and so become the mediator between God and man, giving power to as many as believe in him to be the Son of God. But because the Godhead alone could not suffer death, and neither could manhood overcome death, he joined both together in one person, that the weakness of one would suffer and be subject to death, which we had deserved, and the infinite and invincible power of the other, that is of the Godhead, should triumph and purchase for us life, liberty, and perpetual victory. Now as we come to our next hymn, let's just listen. Now I invite Lisa to come forward and sing this or re sing, read Psalm twenty three.
Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me shall lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear of no evil. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointed my head with oils. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now invite Steve Arnett to come as he reads the lesson from John 10, 1 through 4 and verse 7. Hey everyone, this is John 10, one through four and verse seven. Truly, truly, I say to you, who, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by his name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And then verse 7, Jesus therefore said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I now invite you to anyone who'd like to tell about, uh, reflect on Ian's life and in their life, to please come forward. Oh, I, uh, to start with, you'll go ahead, yes. And then we'll also have uh, Ian's brother Frank involved in this as well. Who would, who would like to start? Okay. Ian was very active in the Masonic lodges in uh, Illinois and Ohio. And when he moved to West Virginia, he came to see us here in St. Albans at our lodge. And uh, as with everything Ian ever did, he put 100% into it, or more, and uh, he became very active in our lodge, rising to the office of worshipful master, and uh, he was so good at it that uh, he, he, like I said, everything he did, whether it was woodworking, uh, anything in life, he, he did it 100% or better, and uh, he was such a fine gentleman, and uh, we really miss him. And I will tell you, I'm extremely proud to have called him my brother. Thank you. Frank, Ian's brother on the phone, and we're going to try and let him talk, and hopefully the microphone picks it up. So, Frank, take it away. Okay. Good uh, afternoon, everybody. Uh, hope that everybody is in good health. Uh, I want to just briefly go through some of the things that uh, my brother and I were able to uh, enjoy while we were growing up. Uh, we were born in Leverage, Ohio, and and uh, we both went to Charles F. Brush High School. He, Ian was three years ahead of me, so I had to follow all the things that he did. Uh, unfortunately, he was the smart one, and I was the one that uh, came along behind. But uh, anyways, uh, we had a good, good childhood, and, and then uh, he got married, and uh, next thing we know that he's coming out to... Uh, uh, to uh, South Russell, Ohio, to build a home. And uh, at that point, I was able to help him build it. And then after he got the house built, then his work took him up to uh, Chicago area. And uh, we kind of lost touch there for a while, but uh, his uh, wife at the time was in poor health, so 
when she passed me and came down to St. Albans to visit. And uh, then uh, he came again uh, a little while later and stayed, and that's when uh, we kind of made a, a, a little guy in cahoots with uh, a couple people from the church to uh, have a party, and unbeknownst, we set up a blind date for Marion and Ian. <laughs> And uh, as you can tell, it turned out okay. So, uh, uh, but uh, he was very, very involved with woodworking. Uh, he was uh, extremely good at it. Uh, I only really went to uh, Scotland for a little over a year to study furniture restoration. And we were, my wife, Mara, and I were fortunate enough to be able to. Uh, go over there and see his school and spend some time with him while he was over there as well. So uh, when, uh, when he came back to this country and what have you, that uh, he then started a, a furniture restoration shop. He had built a, a beautiful workshop there in St. Albans. And uh, so we spent a lot of hours in there helping him out and what have you. Uh, he also was the one that got me started in masonry, and uh, uh, my entire male side of the family was very involved in masonry all you know, through my dad's life and uh, both, both of my brothers and then myself. And uh, so it was uh, an interesting time in St. Albans, and we had uh, a lot of parties, a lot of church parties. Uh, uh, New Year's Eve progressive dinners and that type of thing that we all enjoyed having at our house and other houses throughout. Uh, just trying to catch up with my notes here a little bit. Uh, but uh, like I say, he was extremely involved with uh, with masonry, with what uh, you look like, and uh, the, uh, the lodge there in, in town. And uh, but so we had we had good times together. Uh, unfortunately, when he got his stroke, uh, uh, that kind of disabled him from being able to uh, to do much from that point on. And of course, uh, with that in mind, we miss him dearly as far as the uh, what he was able to accomplish and, and what have you. And it's just a shame that that he came. Uh, to having a stroke, but the good Lord has his own way of knowing what he does with us. Uh, that's about all I have to say. Uh, it was uh, good years growing up and uh, learned an awful lot from him, and not only in woodworking, but in uh, the ways of uh, life and, and trying to keep me straight. So uh, I, I again wish that I would have been able to be there in person, but uh, that's not happening. So, everybody back there, take good care of yourselves. Stay out of uh, the harm of uh, of this COVID stuff that is out there, and it looks like we're on the on the right track of the COVID. So, uh, you all take care. And that's about all I have to say. Thank you very much for the time and that be able to be able to say a few words. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, since I'm up here, I'm going to go ahead and hog it for a bit more. I'm sure everyone wants to hear me talk again. Um, I was just going to share that one of, uh, you keep hearing the theme that Ian was a great woodworker. And so out in the fellowship hall as you're leaving, there's a table with some of the samples that he had put together. There's a little piece with some inlays. There's a tray that's beautiful. But my personal favorite happens to be the clock that sort of stands there in the middle. Um, growing up, we lived right up the street here. And I had a huge maple tree right outside my bedroom window. Well. Sadly, at some point, my mom and Ian decided they had to take it down. So I was distraught, even though it was no longer my bedroom. But Ian made the clock for me out of the maple wood. So that's just something very special that I hold in my heart and we have in our home now in North Carolina. Ian was very special to me. Uh, <clears throat> when I first came into the Masons, Ian helped me tremendously with my coaching and, and my teaching to uh, 
and helped me to be raised to the sublime degree of Master Mason. Uh, Ian was not a, a loud, boastful man, but when you was in his presence, you felt a force that that he just extruded from him. That he uh, he would do everything a hundred, like they said, a hundred percent. He never he never did anything halfway. In my humble opinion, Ian was is what every Mason should strive to be: uh, dedicated to his community, to his family, to his brother Masons. Uh, he was just a perfect example of what we should all strive to be in this life. Uh, he's been, I've missed him terribly, and he will always, always hold a special place in my heart. Well, this is going to be a little bit of a ramble, but you've got to follow me here. <laughs> About 21 years ago, my wife and I moved on 8th Avenue right down the street from Ian and Marion, and that's when we met them, and uh, we invited them to our home one night, and I don't know if you remember that or not, but, you know, we had a pleasant evening of chit-chat and talk, and that's how we sort of got to know each other. But we didn't hang out much over the t those next several years but you know I'd see Ian going by in his green van that he had at that time and he'd stop and we'd holler and talk and he'd usually have a big pile of wood in the back or something you know and we talked about woodworking because at a time when I got laid off from FMC in South Charleston Judy and I moved to North Carolina and I got involved in woodworking down there and uh, got to working with a master woodworker in Charlotte and I learned a lot from him. When I came back here, that's where Ian and I made the connection. Fast forward uh, six, seven years ago, I guess. Um, I decided I wanted to build a guitar. So Ian drove down the street in his green van at that time before it was wrecked. And he stopped and I said, hey, Ian, I'm thinking about building a guitar. Uh, is that something you'd like to be involved in? And he said, that sounds like a lot of fun. So I ordered up a bunch of wood and it came in. And, and so we talked about it and he said, come down to the house on Tuesday and uh, we'll get started. Come down about 10 o'clock and we'll work some that day. So I did. Went down there about 10 o'clock. We worked a couple hours. Took a lunch break, worked another hour and a half or so, and then he had something to do. So he said, come back on Thursday about 10 o'clock. So Thursday morning, I show up at Ian's shop, and he's not there. And so I hung out a little while, and he didn't come, and I called, and there was no answer. And I thought, well, he's gone to the hardware store or the bank or something like that. Well, he never did come, so I just went back home. So that afternoon, Mary called me, and she said, this morning about 5 o'clock, Ian woke me up, and he took his hand and went like that. And she said he'd suffered a massive stroke during the night. And so here I am, <laughs> two hours into a guitar build with no idea what I'm doing. You know, well, some idea what I was doing. So uh, that became really uh, the turning point for a relationship that he and I, and I had, and Marion as well, of course. So uh, he was able to communicate to Marion about two weeks in to just give me the key to his shop and let me do what I needed to do. So I'd go down there and I'd work on this guitar thing. And I'd go to the hospital and show him what I did. And I'd go back and I'd work some more and I'd go to the hospital and show him what I did, you know. And, and both of us got great joy out of that, I think. I think Ian was encouraged by it and I felt his support and love that he opened his shop to me. So time went on and he got out of the hospital and he went to rehab and I'd go to the rehab unit and take him to stuff and 
So as it turns out, about six months later, I finished the guitar before he ever got home. And um, so then he came home, but then as a transition from that, a friend of mine, a great guitar player, said, man, why don't you build a guitar for me? So, so, so I started on number two, and I would take it to Ian and show him, and so things progressed. And, and so over the years, you know, as Ian came home, and, and, you know, it was encouraging to me, and I think it was encouraging to him to share what I was doing and um, at some point in that transition, uh, I used to be in, co in to cars real heavy, and Jim Hubbard and I go way, way back in that. I had an old 48 Chevy pickup truck I'd worked on for years, and I just knew that I was never going to finish it. So I put it on eBay and sold it and bought a bunch of woodworking equipment <laughs> and changed my whole shop over to woodworking stuff. So in, so I built a bunch of guitars, and uh, I showed them all to Ian, and the last one that I got to show him was in Charlotte when you guys had moved there, and I took it by and visited with him, and that was, and that was the last time I saw Ian. But he was not a happy guy once he had his stroke. He was, his life just changed because he was so hands-on and so brilliant and so inventive and creative but even in his stroke, his creative side came out in art. And so he took his l left hand, which was not his dominant side, and he began to draw and color. And man, I don't know if you guys saw that or not, but how impressive that was. So I miss him, but I know he's not frustrated like he was and hopefully now he's took that creative side on to heaven and he's doing some great stuff up there and I hope to see him again someday any others And this is not pressure to come up. You don't have to. You can t share all the stories <laughs> later in the fellowship. In the front row over there, but this isn't pressure to come up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I don't know that anyone can really talk to what Steve shared there. So, um, but thank you to everyone who has spoken, and, and thanks to everyone for coming. On behalf of my mother, I wanted to thank you all for coming, being here, and supporting us. I know it's strange times, but it's still important to celebrate life. Not just Ian's life passing, but something more. Ian was always an officer and a gentleman. He learned some of that as a gunnery sergeant in the Marines. His parents were the first to convey these ideals to this tall gentleman, at sometimes, mostly I think, shy and withdrawn. However, this gave him something far more important. That was an abiding belief in Jesus Christ. Later, Masonic ritual and rules reinforced those ideals. And that is how Ian lived his life. In 2014, Ian suffered a de debil deliberating stroke. And in those few minutes, he lost the ability to make beautiful things from wood. No more would the wholesome smell of baking bread fill the home or whatever lovely treats he was gonna make for dinner. Ian worked through this and the struggles and he used his left hand to create works of beauty. He studied the markings of birds, flowers, and accurately reproduce them on these papers. Again, you can see some of his examples in the fellowship hall. The hardest thing to accept for my mom was the loss of his voice. No more quoting Burns or reciting long passages of Masonic ritual. It is interesting to note that when truly frustrated, he clearly did manage to say a few words from his days in the Marines, <laughs> ones that I'm not sure I could repeat here. Yet through it all, Ian never forgot to extend his left hand with a strong grip, show kindness and love to all those he met. Above all, Ian's faith never faltered. So today, I ask you to join me in celebrating Ian's new life. Ecclesiastes 9, 7. Eat thy bread with joy and drink thy wine, or scotch for Ian, with a merry heart. Thank you all again for coming.
any others? Like I said, you can always share in the fellowship hall afterwards. Let me start by saying that uh, I am part Scott. Large, the largest part of me is Welsh, but that's a whole other story. But I'm, I'm, I'm a Scott. Uh, my wife, uh, Reverend Jan Jenkins, and I actually served a Church of Scotland congregation for four and a half years. My grandfather Laird's ancestry comes from Scotland, although because he was of the lower clans and the higher clans wanted his, his ancestors' lands for their sheep, he and his, his ancestors got shipped over to Ireland to try to convert and tame them, and we know how that worked. But even though I claim to be a Scot, it's only a small percentage, especially compared to Ian Moyer. Ian was a Scot through and through, shared his, his Scottish nature through his poetry, through his cooking, through his, his uh, work. He raised shape. He ra raised shape. He raised, that's how they would say it in Scotland, yes. He raised sheep so that later he and his brother Frank, who was really the wizard at this, would put together some haggis for their consumption. Haggis, um, if you're a, a Scot, put up with this for a second. I'm trying to help everybody else. Haggis is sort of like um, a sausage to the rest of us. Not quite the same. It's, it's actually very delicious, but when you hear what goes into it, you might go, boy, I'm glad I don't know what goes into my sausage, because it, you take a sheep stomach lining, and you fill it with all the leftover meats, the, the tongue, the, the liver, the, the lungs, the heart. You mix in oatmeal and and all the condiments and onions, and that gets all cooked together. And then that's served with mashed potatoes and turnips or shepherd's pie. And, and of course, you have to have the, uh, the, the wonderful water of life to go with it. Ian would recite poems written by Scotland's favorite poet, Robert Burns, and once visiting Scotland, he was given the high honor to address the haggis, as they called it, reciting from memory Burns's famous poem, To the Haggis. He was a Scot through and through, like I said, whether it was in his clothing, his food, his poetry. He played the flute and tin whistle and bagpipes. But, you know, Ian, being a Scot wasn't like the Scots that my wife and I served with in this congregation, in the Church of Scotland congregation. He was not doer, as they would say. Doer, it's maybe a word you don't, may not be aware of. It's, it's a kind of a prideful nature, uh, the prideful nature that Scots will allow themselves. They are stone cold calculating, uh, no emotion, they're thrifty to the nth degree. If you as a minister go visiting someone's home and you ask for a wee bit of dram, they'll wonder why you didn't bring your own bottle. So Ian shared some of this type A focused, detailed person, especially in his engineering nature. He could be Focused and because of that focus, sometimes lose his connection with everything around him. But as you've heard from the stories, he was not a Scot in the normal way, being, being very personable, very connected, not stuck in that Scottish emotional trap. You see, for example, even as a city dweller, having lived in Cleveland and Chicago, he maintained a, a farm with a flock of about 20 sheep. That's his Scottish nature. However, one of his little lambs 
that he later named Scotty had a lame leg. And that Scotty, well, he allowed that little lamb to grow up and grow old and live its full life on the farm. It was not ever taken. And you can see the split in his true Scottish nature and his altered Ian Scottish nature in his woodworking that we've heard about already. He would have all his tools clean and sharp and ready. Right, Steve? Yes. But unlike the Scot, he would sometimes have two, three extra copies of each tool just in case he dropped one, lost one. It was way over on the other side of on the workbench so he could get to it more quickly. Ian, with his engineering skills, took after many of famous Scots through history. In fact, he designed and has a patent for a pizza oven to make Chicago-style pizza. Yet Ian was also a great cook, and he took over the kitchen. After Ian and Marion married, he just kind of shoved her out, and he took over the cooking. And it became so much his kitchen that Marion said she'd walk in to find something, and he had rearranged all of the drawers and cabinets. She had no idea where to find things. In fact, the only thing Ian would allow her to do in the kitchen was to maybe wash some dishes. I want to add a little something about uh, the stories that Marion told me of how Marion and Ian met. Marion said, here's our story. We met Christmas Day briefly. I was we wearing my clan tartan. Was that what attracted him first? Then December 31st was a church progressive dinner. Ian with Frank and I went with Alan and Jerry. We talked a little. Huh. Marion had no idea anything had happened. Suddenly, three weeks later, a special box showed up at her house in the mail. Long stem red roses, all in, in a box that Ian had made, specially prepared with dry ice and wet cloths to keep the roses in peak uh, condition. And Marion said for the next, through, next few months, all they did is talk every night, and he would just recite Burns' poetry to her. And all Marion could say is, who does that? Six le weeks later, he was back to St. Albans making pizza, impressing her parents. And Easter break, Marion said she went to to uh, visit in, in Chicago with him. And, and then at Easter in 1999, when uh, Lisa came home from college, she was surprised to find a ring on her mother's hand already. And they got married June 19th, 1999, right here at First Pres Presbyterian Church of St. Albans. And the hymns you've heard today, and, and uh, were those hymns used in their wedding ceremony. And they've been together thick and thin ever since that day. And Marion said that Ian spoiled her with all of his abilities in cooking, his knowledge of how to maintain a home, his willingness to do for her parents, and he would do anything and go anywhere that she wanted. She said, we had 14 good years and six still good ones. Lisa, in her own stories, as, as you've heard, uh, also learned to love Ian in her own way because of Ian's unscottish ways. I mean, Ian did everything he could to include Lisa, to make her feel like you were her daughter, or you were his daughter, excuse me. And especially when she was in college, when she would come home, uh, he was thoughtful enough to make sure they played games together. And the secret was that Ian didn't like to play games. But he would play games to be with Lisa. 
And he, of course, you would also understand that he was very good at the skillful ones, you know, Clue and, and Uno. Uh, yet, if he would ever lose, he would accuse them of ganging up on him. Yes, Ian was the perfect gentleman, the perfect friend, the one who was willing to go uh, the extra mile, and which, which told a little, a little more about his Scottish and un-Scottish ways. I know when I would go visit, I was always impressed also with his artistry, as Steve mentioned, talking about his work, uh, something that started out as a rehab effort to color with his left hand to follow lines. Well, when he would color, uh, I, and I don't know if any of you ever do anything like that. You probably do what I do. You take a, a color and you color in a, an area. And then you get another color and you color in another area. You stay within the lines. You're really good about that. And you make everything even and smooth. But when Ian followed a, 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 a prepared page, he didn't just color in a color. He would add shades. If he was coloring in a piece of clothing on a picture, he would put in folds. The, the picture was no longer just a 2D representation. It was 3D. It was alive. And one day I went to visit, and one thing that uh, Ian was fond of doing was taking medieval pages and uh, of capital letters and coloring them in. So one day when I went to visit, he surprised me with a big capital J, all colored in. And again, you can't appreciate the details. You'd have to see it up close because again, it's all shaded. It's the clothing looks like it has folds and creases. And his engineering skill still showed because the Cupid, he colored in the nipples. And I'm sure he did that with his typical grin. And you can see that detail in his woodwork that we've already heard about. And the, my, the famous, the, the, the piece I really appreciated was the bench he had in front of their fireplace at home that had an inlay with different shades, different grains, different qualities of wood in the top. But it didn't look like it was put there. It was so well done. It looked like someone had sliced this log and there it was right there. It was that well done. It was part of the structure, not just added in. But most of all, I remember that Ian at his best as again, as I met him after the stroke, that he, he was a God-hungry, faithful Scot. He had been elected by congregations here and in Chicago to be uh, an elder, part of the session, the, part of the governing body of the church. And it was always his desire to live out God's faithfulness. And it showed in the way he loved everyone and, and anyone. And he was always anxious as we would end to make sure that I would pray. And there were times as well that he would add in as best he could the prayer as we came to the end of our, our time together. So as we come to, toward this end of this message, we too will end up in prayer, just like we would meet with Ian. We do so with a prayer first coming from a Scottish 15th century prayer. It'll be uh, added with a pastoral prayer from me, and then we will together uh, do the, sing, uh, read the Gloria Patri. And then I will step forward, pick up Ian's ashes, the piper will come down, and I, and as we go out, we will follow the Piper and Marion and Lisa and go into the fellowship hall.
to, gr to greet and share other stories. So as we leave, let us come together in prayer. And let's begin with this unison prayer from the 15th century. God, be in my head and in my understanding. God, be in mine eyes and in my looking. God, be in my mouth and in my speaking. God, be in my heart and in my thinking. God, be at mine end and at my departing. God of grace and hope, we thank you for life, for love, for good memories, for the gift of age, and for the wisdom that comes from experience. We bless you for the constant presence, for with there is fullness of joy. Give us the courage and faith to accept life as it comes, confident that the future is yours and that we belong to you forever. Continue to bless Ian's family and friends with your promise of eternal hope and salvation. Give them your peace, which comes in the courage of belief. Grant us the insight in acknowledging Ian's life in and through your faith and love. Now, may you, our God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, make us complete in everything good, so that we may do God's will, working among us that which is pleasing in God's sight. And we pray all this through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, it is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Thank you.